it a show runs Jesus in mind Oh what a vortex of glory divine Heir of salvation purchase of God born of his spirit washed in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long perfect submission perfect delight visions of rapture now burst on my side angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love this is my score Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises sing Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing The promises cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God, I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. Standing on the promises of God. Jesus.
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide, he will wash away my sin, let this little child come in, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me, I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. But holy lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found. In his righteousness alone, thoughtless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. We've been talking so far this morning, singing about the blessed assurance. And a big part of that blessed assurance is that Jesus went ahead and he built a place for us so that when we cross out of this life into the next, we'll have a really good place to go. Somewhere beyond the grave, there is a
some call it dreaming Let me dream on Some call it paradise Somewhere beyond the skies Some call it heaven But I call it You know, we as human beings like a little bit of assurance. Very similar to the word insurance. Most of us all had insurance. But when you think about blessed assurance, not very blessed, but when you go buy a new car, it comes with a warranty. That gives you assurance that if there's some defect in it or something goes wrong within the allotted time, they're going to fix it. So you have assurance that you're not going to have a piece of junk sitting in the driveway that you're still making payments on. Although sometimes we all know that in the past they've, <laughs> that's been questionable. They had to come up with a lemon law because of such stuff as that. <clears throat> Blessed assurance. We can count on that because that comes from God. Any kind of assurance we have that comes from man, you never know. It's probably going to be okay, but you never know. But when God makes you a promise, that's it. It's set in stone. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the Apostle Paul is talking, writing, and he says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul greets the church at Philippi in this letter. He addresses the believers with a prayer of thanksgiving, and Paul shares with them the good news that God is still working on them. Isn't it good to know that God isn't through with us yet? You see... Paul was expressing truths that apply to all of us. And the truth is that God's not finished with us until He calls us home. And that's something to be thankful for. God is still working on us. Or I could still say, I could say instead, God is still working on me. And there's a lot of room for improvement. But when I look behind me and see where I've come from, I say, man, I've come a long way. But I still have a long way to go. But God's not through with me yet, just like He's not through with you. Next scripture I'm going to read, I'm going to read it in three different translations. Each one words it just a little bit differently. It's saying the same thing, but it just adds to the, the feel of it when they use different words. You see, because in the Greek that the Bible was translated out of, they have, might have three or four different words, and we might have three or four different words, and they may, you know, it's just, it's different. So you can use different words, and it's still correct translation. First is uh, it's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 is a scripture, and I'm going to read it in the King James Version. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now I'm going to read the same scripture in the New American Standard Version. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now this last version I'm going to read it from is the International Children's Bible. Now I don't know about y'all, but when I need to understand something, they have to break it down to the children's level and then I can grasp a hold of it. So listen to it. This is my favorite version of this scripture in the children's Bible. It said, let us look only to Jesus. 
He is the one who began our faith and He makes our faith perfect. Jesus suffered death on the cross, but He accepted the shame of the cross as if it were nothing. He did this because of the joy that God put before Him. And now He is sitting at the right side of God's throne. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad we don't have to do this all our own, this earthly walk? Aren't you glad God didn't just say, yon, yon, do the best you can? No, He's doing a work in us. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. None of us has arrived yet. The Apostle Paul, as great as he was, said, I'm not there yet. God's still doing a work with me. We are all still works in progress. And God is not done with any of us yet because if He was done with us, we wouldn't be here. We'd be called home. I am not what I want to be when He gets through with me someday. As we travel towards eternity, we are mere clay in the hand of the heavenly potter. He's working for us now and He has great plans for us throughout eternity. The old song goes, Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after Thy will. Not our will, but God's will. I, I heard a minister one time, he was a potter, makes pots on the potter's wheel. And he brought a potter's wheel in and set it up on the platform at church. And he was preaching and making a pot out of clay. You know, the clay's soft and pliable and it's spinning and he's forming it. And he got to talking and got our attention, got us kind of distracted. And all of a sudden, he grabbed that clay up, watered it up in a ball and just threw it down on that potter's wheel and started back. He said, God never throws away the clay. You see, basically, the potter, if the pot doesn't come out like he wants it to, then he takes that same clay and wads it up and starts all over again. And that's good news for me. I don't know about y'all, but that's good news for me because God's had to start over with me several times. You see, but the, the good thing about it is he's going to do it again. He's not going to hang out to dry and he's not going to throw the clay away. If the clay gets too dry, he's going to wet it down. Whatever it takes. Mold me and shape me after thy will. If it wasn't, if, if we're, if the more pliable we are to God's will, the less He has to mold us and shape us. But that's another lesson. We have countless reasons for rejoicing in our relationship with the Lord. If you add up all your sins, that's how many reasons you have to be rejoicing that God doesn't throw away the clay, that He keeps molding and shaping us, and He forgives us every time. Paul uses a strong word to describe the hope that he has in Jesus. The word confidence means to persuade, to convince beyond all doubt. We can have absolute assurance that we are saved and heaven bound. Some call it heaven, but I call it home. Some call it dreaming, let me dream on. Some call it paradise, somewhere beyond the skies. Some call it heaven, but I call it home. And we can have that blessed assurance that heaven will be our destination when God calls us home. How can you know that you are saved? There are several ways we're going to talk about today, and that's, what, that's the blessed assurance to knowing that we're saved and that we're going to heaven. Number one, when you have believed in Jesus... 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father and loves the child born of Him. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 15, it says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. You see, we have a story I'm going to talk about now. Paul and Silas were preaching, and they had been told not to. And so they kept on preaching. They said, we got to obey God rather than man. And they were in jail. 
And they were bound up. They were hands and feet were tied. And they had a, a guard watching them. And then they were inside a cell and we could, the, the, the cell door was shut. Well, an earthquake came up. Boom. The gate sprung open. The, the door to the cell came open. And their shackles fell off their hands and feet. And they were just standing there just free as a breeze. Well, the jailer was getting ready to take his own life because back in that day, if you let the prisoners escape, you died in their place. Acts chapter 16, verse 29, the, the uh, jailer, he called for the lights and rushed in. Trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They had his attention, didn't they? He was about to kill himself because he, they th he thought they got away, but they hadn't got away. They were still standing there. Verse 31, Paul and Silas said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And there ain't nothing changed. It's still the same. Believe in the Lord Jesus. If Paul and Silas were standing right here right now, they would tell you, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. You'll know you are saved when you have turned your back on the old life of sin. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. You may notice we're going to use a lot of scriptures out of 1 John. If you want to feel secure in your salvation and you want something to read in the Bible that will help you, read 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, it says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcome the world, our faith. What does it mean to turn your back on your old life of sin? Does it mean that you'll never sin again? Does it mean that if you do sin, you weren't saved? Or does it mean if you do sin, you lose your salvation? Well, I don't believe any of that. We'll all be sinners until the day we die. We are human, we therefore err. What that means is that our heart is set on things above. It means that when we do sin, we are sad over it and we don't want to do it again. But it doesn't mean that God kicks us out of the family. God is in the saving business, not the kicking out of the family business. God didn't send Jesus to die on the cross just so we could get kicked out over a technicality. No. God loves us and He made us this way and that's how it is. You're not going to lose your salvation because you make a mistake. You lose your salvation if you never did believe in Jesus in the first place. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Creature, The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. If you are a new creature in Christ, you don't long for the same things you used to. It means now you hunger and thirst after righteousness. If you are a new creature, you don't want to be like you were. If you are a new creature, when you do fail, you don't just lay there and wallow in it. You get up, dust yourself off, and look forward to doing better tomorrow. You'll know that you are saved when you have a desire to keep His commandments. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 says, This we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word in Him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him ought Himself to walk in the same manner as Jesus walked. When our desire is to be obedient, and that's not going to be 100% of the time, but our desire will always be in obedience. We think about King David. God called him His Beloved. And he failed many times, many times. He made many mistakes. But he didn't just lay there and wallow in it. He got up and went on about his business praising God and doing God's work. And that's what we have to do. We don't just give up whenever we mess up. 
when you when you had kids and they messed up, did you kick them out? No, because kids mess up, don't they? We're God's children, and we mess up, and God still loves us even though we mess up. You'll know that you are saved when you genu genuinely love the brethren. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, this may hit a little close to home for some folks. I'm sure not anybody in here. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Where does this leave room for any sort of hatred? There is no room for that. If you hate someone because they were born in a different country, if you hate someone because their skin is a different color, if you hate someone because they favor a different political party. If you hate someone because they have more or less money than you. Some poor people hate the rich. Some rich people hate the poor. There's no room for any of that in the kingdom of God. There's no reason, no room to hate anyone. Verse 8 I'm going to read again. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. The ability to know that you are saved is not some fond, foolish wish. It's not a, it is a biblical truth. It is something that you can know for sure. It's personal. God, uh, Paul used the word you. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Not might perfect it, will perfect it. I am convinced that God won't let you go no matter what you do. God is going to continue His work in you until He calls you home. Our confidence is powerful. There is nothing more liberating and freeing to the Spirit then knowing for sure that you have been saved. You need to know and you need to know based on evidence. Some people will tell you that you can't know for sure if you're saved. Some people that will tell you that you won't be saved if you're not righteous enough. There's no assurance in that. There's no blessed assurance in that. You would live in constant fear. I've been there. The church I grew up in was like that. But that's just not true. That's not the way it is. And if, let, me, let me be perfectly clear. If you had to be good enough to go to heaven, none of us would make it. But the truth is that when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our righteousness, which is as filthy rags, is exchanged for His, which is 100%. That's the only way we could ever be able to go to heaven is because we accepted Jesus and He applied His righteousness to us. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul had been a persecutor of Christians before he was transformed, before he was saved. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to be reborn. He knew what it was to be changed. Before his Damascus experience, Paul hated Christians. Back in the day, I've known people who hated other people because of the church they were members of. Isn't that sad? In Ireland, not that many years ago, there was a war between the Catholics and the Protestants. That's sad. They were killing each other. And they would, they would, they would catch them and put them in jail, and then they would go on hunger strikes. 
There's a lot of research about people dying of starvation during that, but that wasn't a good way to do it. And that was because of hate. And you had the Catholics here and you had the Protestants here and they both believe in Jesus. There's a little difference here and there about their methods. But they both believe in Jesus. All of that was hatred, pure and simple. And I could tell you that I don't agree with what the Muslims believe, but that's okay. We have freedom of religion in this country. I still love them. God does not allow me to hate anyone for any reason. You can love somebody that you don't agree with. And what's really sad right now is the, is, is the hatred between the two major political parties in this country. That's sad. That's really sad. We're all Americans. And the, who wins when we're, we're, we're fighting and trying to devour one another? The politicians. That's who wins there. And we lose. We both lose. We need to love one another. There's no room for hatred in a Christian's life. If Jesus can save a Christian persecutor, He can save me. God didn't allow Jesus to be tortured and crucified just to let us get away and get lost on a technicality. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, And He has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so the power of Christ may dwell in me. We're all weak. We're human. Humans are weak. We make mistakes because we are weak. But God is good and God forgives us and God helps us. He's doing a work in all of us trying to make us better every day, step by step, day by day. And sometimes it feels like I'm taking one step forward and three steps back. Well, that's okay because God's going to find me where I am and continue that work in me. We may have to take the same lesson over and over and over, but God's going to keep giving me that lesson until I get it. And then we're going to move on to the next. I'm going to close with this scripture. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be